Olá a todo mundo. Uh, eu sou o Jamie, uh, Jamie Kirkpatrick. Uh, eu vou me introduzir. Uh, na verdade, eu, vou, eu não vou fazer esse uh, discurso em português. Uh, mesmo que eu poderia tentar, eu acho que eu, uh, eu vou perder algumas coisas que eu poderia falar mais facilmente em inglês. Então, eu também vou fazer em inglês de Inglaterra. E aí, uh, se eu fico falando uh, com o sotaque que vocês não podem compreender, desculpa, mas eu vou tentar falar devagar. Ok, so now I switch. <laughs> um, so, as I said, my name is Jamie Kirkpatrick. I uh, came here from Sweden, as, as you said. Um, I, uh, I joined Spotify in 2011 um, as a developer. And um, when I joined Spotify, I quite quickly realized that I wanted to try on a different hat. I've been a developer for about 10 years. Um, and so I moved into the product department. And I'm now, uh, well, at the time I was a product owner. And I'll go into a bit more about what that means at Spotify. Um, today, I, I have the title of uh, Director of Product for, for SDK. Somebody a minute ago just talked about uh, how <laughs> SDKs have a bad reputation. <laughs> but, um, Our SDK essentially means uh, more than just like libraries, it's, it's our, our web APIs, it's, um, it's a bunch of things, it's, it's more of a kind of strategic thing. Uh, so it's, um, we essentially provide tooling for external uh, partners to integrate with Spotify. And uh, depending on what kind of integration you're doing, that might be uh, a C library for like the super constrained embedded cases, or it might be uh, web services for the more kind of general cases. Uh, so it's a range of tools basically, um, and, and the teams that I look after are responsible for kind of developing those tools, and I work more on the, the strategy side. Um, so today um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, kind of our journey with, with API strategy. Um, and Spotify is a services company in terms of the fact that we provide everyone with, with, with a service, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. But uh, it's also like a product company. So uh, day to day, my focus is, is thinking about how to make our product more awesome. Uh, and so it's a slightly different angle to some of the things that have been talked about before today. But I think some of the things that, uh, the ways that we think about things are probably applicable in many different kind of arenas. So today I want to talk a little bit about Spotify for those of you that don't know. Um, and then I'll tell you about our journey, uh, which is more of a story. <laughs> and then I hope to tell you about some of the things that we took away from that that might be interesting to think about, as I say, in, in, in other places. Okay, so, the pitch, who's Spotify? Uh, you, you, I think by now people in Brazil know. Um, but last time I was here, um, they didn't. Uh, or oh, a lot of people didn't. We are uh, the world's biggest streaming music service, uh, which is a kind of a nice thing to be able to say. Um, but it was, it was started in 2006 by, by two Swedish entrepreneurs, well, a Swedish entrepreneur and, uh, and a guy who was more of an investor, but is now the chairman of the board. Um, Daniel Ek is the, the CEO of the company, and Martin Lawrence, the chairman of the board. And in 2006, They saw an opportunity to, to disrupt a, a, a market um, which was, looked like it was sewn up, which was the, the music industry. Uh, at the time, Apple were, were dominant. Uh, since 2001, with the release of the iPod, uh, everyone had been, you know, I mean, they really took over the world. And, and then you had iTunes, and people would buy music on iTunes, and that was the way you did things. But, Daniel had the, uh, the bright idea that this wasn't going to be the way that things would be forever. Uh, and so basically the proposition was that he believed that in the future, streaming would be the way that people would consume music. They wouldn't buy music anymore. Uh, they, would, they would stream it from the internet. It would be so cheap that you could do that. Uh, so essentially he thought that the access model for music would change. And that, so the proposition was, We can give you a service that gives you all you can eat, the, if, if all the world's music in one place, uh, versus having to go to iTunes and buy uh, you know, each MP3 separately. 
And uh, well, we're nine years later now, and uh, Apple have kind of paid us the highest compliment that you can get, which is by, by copying us. <laughs> so I think you could say that his idea was vindicated, but um, it's not the end of the story. I mean, this is really the beginning of the road for us. So, so uh, a few kind of numbers. Um, we have, and these are slightly old, but they're the ones that I'm allowed to use. Uh, we have 75 million uh, active monthly users, so it's a huge user base. Um, and out of those, 20 million are, are paying customers. Um, paying varying amounts in different countries, and I discovered it's very cheap in Brazil to have Spotify. Go buy it, tell your friends to. Uh, and the kind of, the, the, the major currency of Spotify, the thing that really makes Spotify kind of uh, a success is the playlist, which is like the kind of the basis of everything we do, I mean, or it has been. Um, so there's two billion of those now. Um, if we look back one year, we were half the size. So, you know, we have bold ambitions. We hope to do the same again. Um, we are in 55 countries. And as I said, we came to Brazil relatively recently. I think it was 2014. Um, I remember before we were in Brazil, and friends of mine would ring me up and ask me to create them accounts uh, so that they could kind of like use it like, you know, a little bit illegally. Uh, so I'm quite glad that I don't have to do that anymore. Um, but we, you know, we, we would like to go further, of course. We want to take over the world. So I think somebody said before uh, that maybe it was the introdu introduction. I'm talking a bit about how we kind of organise. So it's, it's about scale. Um, that's that's the kind of the big question for us. It's both scaling the organisation, the company, but of course scaling the service as well. So when you're growing as fast as we, we are, you need to have like a strategy for that. Like how, how are you going to achieve this kind of these aims? And that really affects both how we organize and how we how we develop software. So some of this is, is going to be fairly well known by now. Um, but I'd like to just give an introduction because it, it really frames what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, we, we, we tried to set Spotify up in a way um, that would kind of empower people working there to, to just do awesome stuff and not, not be blocked. And the way that we did that was by trying to form these, what we call squads. Um, they're, they're small teams that have maybe five to seven engineers in the squad and, and a product owner. Uh, and essentially the idea is that they're like a, a mini startup. So they, they should be able to just like they, they own a part of our mission, and they can, they, can, they can run on their own and get stuff done and iterate on that and uh, you know, build new features without getting blocked by kind of bureaucracy or, uh, or infrastructure or, or any kind of organizational challenges that you would normally, normally see. Um, and I mean, it's, it's really served us very well. Uh, I'll give you some example missions. Uh, we have a team that, for example, own like the artist experience. So when you go to the artist pages on your iPhone or your Android client or your desktop client or, uh, or on the web, that's one team that kind of owns that whole thing. Um, last year we created a, a new experience which was focused around running, um, where the idea is that when you're running, uh, you want to keep a certain pace, so Spotify will, will find music that is in that tempo and it will beat match the music and, and, and uh, mixed between it, and there's a team that own that experience, and they own the whole product. They own the, the kind of the thing from top to bottom. Um, so, actually, just before I leave this topic, the important thing to take away here is that teams are organised for autonomy. So, as I said before, they should be able to get their things done without blocking on anyone else, uh, and that's super important because as you scale the company, uh, if teams become more and more dependent on each other, then you slow down. So, I want to wind back a bit to, to when I started at Spotify, 2011. Um, it was a pretty different place. Uh, Spotify was five years old by this stage, uh, and the world was kind of gradually moving from, from desktop to mobile. 
And we were thinking about that, that challenge, like how are we going to take this on? Because we had a very successful desktop product, but now we needed a mobile product too that was, that was kick ass. Uh, and we were facing some pretty serious challenges at the time. Uh, we, we found that essentially scaling our development was, was kind of not really keeping up with our dream of having these autonomous teams. It was hard. And it was hard because of a few things. One of them was that we had, uh, by that time, what was a very kind of aging code base. Uh, it was, what did I say, six years old which isn't old by many company standards, but is old by Spotify standards. It was monolithic, meaning that there was one kind of thing. It wasn't modularized, um, which really doesn't play well when you have lots of teams who are trying to kind of work on things together. And to kind of talk from the technical side, it was C++ code, which is super fast uh, in terms of like it runs fast. Uh, it's super slow in terms of I want to get something done, I want to write some new code, I want to build something new. Uh, so developers in the room here might be smiling because it's, uh, it's, it's kind of painful. And we were at a point of our development as a company where we wanted to like 4x the number of developers that we had. So and we couldn't find enough C++ developers anywhere, like in the world, we were looking kind of worldwide and it was just super hard challenge. So we wanted to solve that problem. And we also wanted to like, empower teams to, to be able to develop independently, as I said before. So we knew we, knew we, had, we knew we had a problem, and we knew that something needed to change. So this is where uh, the magic word of this conference comes in. Yay! <laughs> a new API. Um, I'm going to explain this little guy first, actually, because he's a, a theme of this, uh, of this talk. Uh, has, everyone see, has anyone seen this movie? Yes. Great. This guy is called Stitch, and uh, Stitch was the code name for the new API uh, that we were creating. And uh, so Stitch was the kind of savior of everything. Stitch appears many times in this talk. So we had uh, a couple of hypotheses that we, we thought would uh, be solved by creating this new API. One. We thought that we would replace most of our homebrewed C++, crazy difficult to work with code, with kind of more standards uh, compliant, like basically web technologies. So the idea was it would be a JavaScript API, and uh, we would build the views in our clients using using web uh, web views, basically web browsers inside your uh, inside your client. So that was that was our bet was if we did this, it would make us faster and we would be able to start iterating and, and shipping a product again. The second hypothesis we had was that this would solve our hiring problem because it's a lot easier to find people who know how to develop in JavaScript than it is to find C++ experts. And then there was the, the dream, the third kind of leg to this, this strategy, which was that we also thought it would be awesome if we opened this API up to the rest of the world. Um, this was 2011, remember, and in 2011, apps, having an app platform was the hot thing, and that was how you were going to win. And we were no different, you know, I mean, we, we, we tried to find ways to kind of, obviously, make our platform more sticky, and getting developers involved and, and having a platform for them, them to create apps on was, was, was one way we thought we could do that. So this is where I get a little bit technical and I'm going to talk about kind of what the stack looks like. I won't go too deep. But basically what you had was essentially a data model. So a way for you, an API that allowed you to, to get at the basics of what kind of Spotify is built on. So you could find out what someone's playlists were. You could find out who followed the user. You could find out you know, what their kind of profile picture is. Whatever the kind of various bits of information you would need to construct like a Spotify client. It's essentially like a data model. So it wasn't solving the problem of how to build views and have them reusable on different platforms or that kind of thing. So if you're one of these teams, these feature teams that I described before, essentially you were writing this stuff up here, feature code. You're writing the artist view, or you're writing the album pages or something like that. And what we did was we take our old C++ code 
And we put a, uh, a JavaScript API on top of that that meant that many more developers were able to, uh, to build things on this. And we had this C++ library uh, for, for a reason. And the reason was that for Spotify, uh, offline is a really, really important piece of our, of our proposition. Uh, we, have a, we have a great offline experience. You can, you can offline playlists, you can navigate around the client when you're offline, which is actually kind of hard to do in, in kind of web browsers in the web world. We're getting there, but in 2011 we were, we were behind where we are now. And I think another thing to say about this, uh, this API was that it was very much built in the heat of battle. It's not, if you, if you were a new company starting up, you would not say, this is, this is the perfect like, thing to build. This is, you actually say, shit, that looks horrible. Like, why C++ and all this stuff? Like, ugh, you think we're big guys. Um, but basically, for, from a Spotify perspective, it's all about reacting and changing according to kind of what's happening in the market. So we needed to do something, we needed to do something fast, and we had legacy. So we built something to get us out of that position. So, second bit of my Disney theme. <laughs> a whole new world. Well, how did we do? What happened? Well, it was awesome uh, in that we, we released on time. And what I can say is that this was the first uh, experience I had uh, at Spotify being part of a big release. And they had a press event for this because we were announcing our app platform. And um, I mean, it's a really, really great way to get everyone kind of focused. It's also really, really painful when you have like, deadlines that you need to work against because you want to deliver a quality <laughs> product. But it was pretty cool to be sort of sat in an audience while Daniel was up on some live stream somewhere talking about the, the platform that we just built and thinking about what all the developers were going to do with it. It was, it was, it was a great feeling. Um, the main metric by which we would measure ourselves was whether or not we could move and ship stuff again, and we could do that, which was good. Uh, we also fixed our hiring problem. Uh, we grew uh, a ton in 2011 and 2012 because hiring uh, JS developers was a lot easier than C++ developers. Uh, and we got a ton of external developers kind of excited and involved with our platform. There are some things that we actually don't do today anymore that I really miss, but at the time we had like Pitchfork in there, we had like you know, Guardian, we had like a lot of big kind of media sites bringing stuff inside Spotify which was really, really cool. And that was due to having this API. So we were doing kind of so, we, we thought we were doing so good with this that we, we started thinking about like, well, what's the next thing? Well, we needed to build mobile apps and we didn't really have, I mean, we had a mobile app, but we were trying to scale the development there, solve the same problems. So we started thinking about taking the same solution to our mobile platforms. And at the time, there were other companies who were headed in a similar direction. So you could look at Facebook, they had like uh, web views inside their clients as well. There was like LinkedIn. There was a bunch of kind of big, big companies doing similar stuff. So we're done, right? Uh, well, obviously that's a rhetorical question. <laughs> we're not done because you're never done. Um, but you guys, you guys already know that. So I want to talk a bit about where where we landed. Uh, here's my friend Stitch again looking a little bit sad. Um, so, I'll come back to the kind of the, the, the title on this slide in a minute. But basically, we, we found that over, over time, we realized that there was, uh, there was an organizational problem that we'd created um, through this strategy. Essentially, the API was owned by a single team in the company, and it wasn't possible for that team to keep up with all the demand from all of the squads who are using this API and wanted to build awesome stuff on it. They wanted new things, and they wanted them now, and they wanted fixes, and they were you know, raring to go. And I know because I was a part of this squad. I was a part of the Stitch squad. So coming back to my diagram before, there were four blocks. And if you were a, a team trying to build a feature at Spotify, you, you basically own two of those. You own the feature code, and you own the underlying backend service. And then the two bits in the middle, they were owned by the other squad, the one that everyone hated. Um, so that was maybe not such a problem when we were all on the same floor in the same building. But like I said, part of this was about us growing and scaling as a company. 
And in that time, we went from maybe five uh, kind of mobile developers uh, to 50 or so, approximately. And we went from maybe like 10 desktop sort of web developers to, to 100. And we went from one location to three locations. So suddenly, like, this was a big problem. If you were in New York and you wanted to get something done, you were you know, waiting for the guys in Stockholm to get up. Um, so that was, that was one big side of it, organizationally. The other side of it was that um, there, it was a public API. We'd released this to people to build things on. And as a public consumer of the API, what you want is stability, consistency, predictability, a bunch of things that are really different from people who are working inside Spotify who just want to move fast, lightning speed. Again, come back to the beginning of the talk. We were organized for speed. We were organized to let people move fast. And we created a kind of uh, an architecture that meant that people were blocked. They were, they were slowing down. In fact, this, come back to the title of the slide, this was actually painted on our squad wall by someone. Uh, I think it was my colleague Johan, who has a bit of a strange sense of humor, but he, he was one of the members of the team who got a lot of complaints from people. People felt like this. We were blocking them, and like they kind of hated us, which sucks. Uh, there was one other side to this as well, which, which was about... Um, you guys remember these days, right? <laughs> it wasn't actually so long ago in Brazil. Uh, so, the other side of this was the runtime problem. Uh, I wanted to just talk a little about what it was like to use this API and like how you would how you would build something. Basically, if you wanted to build, uh, say, the artist view, you probably needed to make a query to find out the artist information, and then when you found the artist information, you might need to find out like who are the followers. And then you would want to find out the top followers, so you might make a call to another API somewhere else to kind of get information about those guys, the profile pictures or something to show or whatever. So you have these API calls that have to happen one after the other. And that, that all adds up, it takes time. And there was another problem. We also, this API was generic. We built an API that kind of went to the public to build anything they wanted with, uh, which meant that we had to send all the data you might ever need, really. Uh, only when we're building views, we know what kind of data we want, and we're throwing half of that data away. That's maybe not such a problem on desktop computers where you've got like a lot of bandwidth, fast DSL, but on mobiles, like that is a problem. Like it costs people money, uh, and, and of course, mobiles are a lot slower than, or they were in those days, a lot slower than, than desktops. And I'd say that for, for Spotify who is a company who, who pretty much built its reputation on having a product that felt lightning fast. I mean, when you, when you press the button in Spotify and you play music, it, it plays fast. And uh, it felt like using iTunes, you know, except that it was coming from the cloud, uh, which was a, a major achievement. But then you were browsing around and, shit, man, there's a spinner here, and it's taking ages to load. You know, so this was, we were not proud of this. So, again, we, we know something's wrong with our strategy. We're doing something wrong here. Uh, so, this was a point where we actually needed to, to ask ourselves some questions, and we did. And the question we asked ourselves was, what are we trying to optimize for? And I think I've already kind of alluded to the answer to this question, like what, what is important to us at Spotify when we're trying to move fast? And there's two parts to it. One is developer speed. That's like probably the, the most important thing at Spotify. Move fast, get stuff done without dependencies on other people in the company. Like you don't want to be waiting on the guy in Stockholm to wake up. You just want to, you want to code when you're inspired and you want to, you know, you want to move fast. This is, and, and, it, and it helps us to, uh, to deliver products faster, which is the ultimate aim. And the other side was uh, the runtime side of things. We wanted our product to feel fast. And it didn't. So views and the application should be loading as fast as possible. So what we realized was that there was a kind of conflict going on. And enabling developers to move fast at Spotify 
meant that they needed to change things often, whenever they wanted. But external developers, as I said before, there's a conflict. They have different needs. When you're, I think somebody had a presentation earlier where they talked about this. Like, I think it was the, uh, your CEO, he was saying, like, don't piss people off by breaking your APIs, you know? I mean, like, it's a contract. When someone builds something against your API, they expect it to keep working, and you should honor that contract. But it's very hard to do that if you're also trying to move fast. So if some developers want stability, consistency, reliability, and we want to move fast. Inside, internally, we like those things. They're nice, but then, like, speed trumps them. So our realization was that maybe this idea of one API that everyone would use, including the external world, was, was not the right thing. One size doesn't fit all. So maybe we should stop trying to make it. Okay, so, take two. Uh, now we know kind of what, our, what our, our hypothesis on our problem is and um, what we're trying to optimize for. So given those things, what should our API strategy look like? How should we solve it? So I've already kind of really covered these pieces here. Um, we wanted to optimize for speed. That was the main, main priority for us. We wanted developers to be able to get stuff done without depending on other people. And we really, you know, we know that some teams rely on infrastructure, it's inevitable. Like somewhere along the lines you rely on the network or you rely on something that you, is not in your control. But we wanted to make sure that we could remove that dependency where we didn't need it. And the other thing was about the runtime. We wanted our application to be super fast. So, uh, you know, in an ideal world, on a mobile phone, if you load the artist view or you load, you load something, it should just have to make one request to somewhere and get everything back it needs, rather than all these, like, I did this, then I did that, then I did this other thing, and then eventually I can show you the thing that you wanted. Because Users don't care about that. They're just like, this sucks. I'm going to use a different product, which I won't name. Uh, so we have a solution, um, which, I will, which I'll show you. And we call this the view-specific API. Uh, so I don't, firstly, I, the first thing I did here was to call out and make, give some credit. Because when we, when we came up with this, this kind of strategy, we, we looked around and we talked to a lot of people in the industry and we were able to stand on the shoulders of some giants. Uh, specifically, uh, I would call out Netflix, uh, who have a huge array of devices and uh, many different platforms, and they're trying to move really fast to, they solve a, a lot of similar problems to us. And uh, so we reached out to their, uh, uh, I guess he was the head of API, or whatever, Daniel Jacobson, and we, we spoke to him. So, he gave us some, you know, some information about what they've done, and they've, they've documented some of this on the web as well, so you, you can find that. I'll send out the, uh, or someone will send out my presentation notes. There's links in there for this stuff. Um, so basically, what it is is what I said before. It's it's a, it's an API that's tied to a specific view and a specific client. It aggregates all the data you need to build that view in one go. Uh, so instead of having to make all these calls, we do that on the back end. We build a special little, you know, JSON payload or something that we send to the client that is just specifically for that one case. It only sends what you need. If you are on a mobile, we don't send you a huge image. We send you the small one because, hey, you didn't want the like high res thing. Um, so as I hear, we have versions for different devices. Now the big difference from from, from what we had before was that this was much more tailored to our organization. Basically, you're the feature team, so you own this. And you own this. And instead of having a special library in the middle, by this time we've managed to solve the offline problem in different ways. And you had the standard network stack, and then you had this view-specific API, which you also own. So basically, that means that now, you don't need anyone else to do what most teams are doing at Spotify. You can you can pretty much work independently for the well-understood problem of building views in clients and making them super fast. <coughs> this was the way that we wanted people to do it. Um, okay, so how did it work out? The good news is that 
this little guy here, Stitch, he, he died for a good cause. Because uh, the things that we wanted to optimize for, which were development and runtime speed, optimizing for those paid off. So I would say that now, a uh, well-architected view in our client is about as fast as we can make it because it is a single round trip to the back end. So if it's slow to load, it's usually because your mobile connection is shitty or something like that. Um, and additionally, we, have, we now have twice as many mobile developers as we had in 2012 when this was a problem. And you never hear people talking about the, the problems that we had back then. So I think we kind of, we get a big tick mark next to like, did we manage to solve the problems with this strategy? Yeah, we did. This guy had to die, which was, which was sad. But. So, great, this is like, or jam and cream, as we say in English. Um, free lunch, you know, should we do this too? Uh, well, of course not. <laughs> you can't have it all, it depends on you. Um, so, essentially, this, this strategy comes with a number of trade-offs. And I'd say the first one is that uh, dog fooding, which is, does everyone know the term dog fooding? Have you heard that before? Okay, cool, I mean, I'm glad I asked, because I'll mention it again in a minute. Dog fooding means eating your own, like eating what you would feed your dog, basically. It's a, it's a, it's a, a term that we use in English to mean like, well, if it's good enough for the dog, it's good enough for me. So this was our strategy before, was we have a single API, we use it inside. If we use it at Spotify, then it means that uh, it will find bugs in it, we'll fix the bugs, the quality will go up, like, you know, essentially, like, if it's good enough for us, then we're happy to give it to our third party developers. But we stopped dog fooding the API that we were using inside. Uh, I mean, we didn't, with the API we're providing to our third parties, we, we have a separate API inside and we now have a, a, a separate public API. So that means that we don't dog food our, we don't use our own public API. And that has a, a, a trade off because our public API now is somewhat behind what we would have inside because we don't put as many people on solving that problem. So that's, that's one trade off. Uh, Having said that, the public APIs can now be stable, consistent, well documented. We can pay attention to the things that you need to pay attention to for a public API. We can give it a different level of kind of care and attention. And I, just to say a little bit more about this, this model of a public API and the differences there and, and, and some of the trade-offs we make. Uh, one of the things that we find today is that because the APIs are somewhat behind what we're doing inside, People are usually saying to us, where's my uh, collection on my Sonos? Or where's my uh, radio on my PlayStation? Or whatever the new feature is that we've done. Because every time we, we innovate and we create new features, we need to create APIs for them too. So this is a new kind of organizational challenge. And, it, and it's also a technical challenge that in 2016, I personally am very invested in trying to solve. Like, can we find a novel way to, to make it more of a push thing, so where we can control kind of the experience, uh, whereas today, like, we, we give you an API to get the collection or get your playlist, and you have to build something against that, and then you have to build something against the new API we produce. Like, is there some way to turn that on its head? I, I don't actually have the answer, but it's definitely something we're thinking about. So, I kind of want to wrap up by just saying, uh, to summarize our learnings on this journey um, and to say that these are not universal rules at all by any means. Uh, some of them might be interesting and might work for you in your situation and um, you don't have to be a product company like Spotify. You, you, this might work for you in all kinds of other cases. Um, and there are also plenty of other counter examples out there of companies who are going in the opposite direction or doing things that look kind of different. So, for example, Facebook, they have this thing called React Native. Some of you developers here might have seen it. It's a framework which kind of allows you to write once and then you get your code on iOS or Android and it's JavaScript based and it solves lots of problems. Uh, so they are actually taking a very different tack on this problem. Uh, I'll be really interested to see how that works out. So, first takeaway was that for us and for maybe some of you, one size doesn't always fit all. 
It's a nice idea, but, you know, question it. The second one was, I'm glad I explained dog food. <laughs> dog fooding, as I said before, nice idea too. Also an awesome thing, and I'm sure in the right circumstances it works, and we do still do this in other cases. That is, eating, consuming the thing you give to all the other people you work with. It's a really, really nice idea, but it's not always the best approach, especially if your use case is very different from that of your consumers, your target audience. So our use case was moving fast, our use case was iterating as quick as we could, uh, our consumers wanted stability and all the rest of it, which meant that, yeah, we're kind of coming at this from different directions. And this one here is more of a kind of a product learning. Um, yeah, burning money. Uh, so, at some point, you know, I mean, we've invested a ton of money and time in our previous strategy. And uh, it's very easy to be convinced that, you know, well, we've spent all this money now. Like, this is the right thing to do. We've just got to carry on. We can just spend more on it, and we can just spend more time and tweak it, and it'll be better. You need to be willing, well, you should be willing, to question your assumptions and pivot. And uh, I think that's something that has served Spotify extremely well over the years. Like, we are, I used to work for a company that was 30 years old. For them to pivot, it might take years. For us to pivot, to decide that, hey, the strategy is wrong, we need to go in a different direction, it could, it could take weeks or, or, or days, who knows? But you need to be willing to question those assumptions. So I think that's a really interesting thing to think about. Like, have you got any situations that are yeah, maybe our questions ringing in your head, but you know, maybe we should flag and say, hey, maybe we should look at this again. So, that's pretty much it for me, which is good because someone's owed me the five minute notice. Uh, almost. Uh, but before I go, before I give you guys a chance to ask any questions that you, you might have, uh, I have this slide. Um, yeah. So, one of the reasons why my uh, company was so willing to let me fly all the way down here to Brazil uh, and take a week out of my life to be here was because, hey, I might meet some really interesting people here. And we might get some of you inspired about uh, the challenges that we face. Um, and, I mean, it may even be that you're going to tell your friends about it, who knows. But, I mean, we're, we're, uh, we're in another growth phase right now, so that means that I would imagine that we will probably I don't know, double in size again in the next year or so. And uh, so that means that we're trying to hire people, and uh, specifically, these are the things that I am, as an individual, looking for, so I'm being selfish by calling out my own needs. Uh, but we have a variety of kind of like roles in all kinds of different uh, uh, areas. I mean, from agile coaching, which you know some of you might have heard about as well, in terms of looking at how we organise, uh, to you know product ownership. Uh, developers of all flavors, engineering managers, like tons of stuff. So, uh, what I'd say is if you're interested in music uh, and you like Spotify as a product, uh, it's an awesome company to work for. That's <laughs> my advert. Uh, I've never regretted being there for a second, so that's why I'm so willing to tell other people. Um, it's, we have offices in three different locations where we do product development. Um, and we, you know, we relocate people and that kind of stuff. But it's a, it's a really interesting experience living overseas. This is my second time. I lived in Brazil before. Por isso eu falo um pouquinho de português. Mas eu não sei se você gostaria de também tentar mudar sua vida. Quem não sabe? Yeah, and that's it. So um, thanks for your time, guys, and uh, I'd love to take any questions.